So it's 11 o'clock at night and I have broken down in the absolute middle of nowhere in New Mexico. So being the mechanic that I am, I get out my best tool, my cell phone, and I call AAA. Fast forwarding a bit, I find myself in the back of a father and son tow truck. So this gentleman, he's about 250 pounds and he's built like a tank and his co-pilot, his 11 year old son. So a few minutes into the ride, I get an oh so familiar question. So what do you do? As a scientist, this question can be quite difficult sometimes because the research that we do, it is very complicated. And it's hard to sometimes put it in terms that everyone can understand. But I decided to give it a shot anyways. So I go, I'm a scientist. And then I met with this kind of hostile question at the lab. I go, yeah, I, I work at the lab. And after clearing up a series of very strong, strong misconceptions about what we do here in Los Alamos, I started talking about some of the exciting research that goes on here, like an HIV vaccine or supercomputing, nanotechnology, alternative energy, medical isotopes, cancer research. And then the tone started to change. They started warming up to the idea that, wow, the lab does some really cool science and it's really relevant to me and my family. And then something really cool happened. His son started asking questions like, how do robots work? What is nanotechnology? Or perhaps my favorite question that he asked, why does everyone in my family wear glasses? A question that I had asked when I was his age. And that led us to genetics and then epigenetics. And then he was getting excited and I was getting excited. And his father was just so proud of his son for being so eager to learn. And our three hour journey went by like that. And it was at the end, I was met with this very firm handshake from this tank of a man and a long lasting statement. He said, I've lived in Santa Fe my whole life and I've never met a scientist. I would like to thank you for answering questions I've never been able to ask. And that really hit home. Here's a man who lives 30 minutes away from one of the densest populations of scientists in the entire world, yet he's never met one. He's never been able to ask that question, like, what is cancer? Or how are we doing on the research? And that got me thinking, you know, he's a voter. He'll ultimately elect politicians that will go to Washington, D.C. and decide the fate of science in our country. And as a scientist, we often find ourselves going, oh, my budget's too small, they're cutting this, they're cutting that. But who's to blame in all of that? Well, you can't rightfully blame one person or one entity, but as a scientist, I feel like it's partially our fault. Because how many of us, when we're met with the question, so what do you do, are champions of science, are the scientific linguist for our research, how many of us strive to inspire scientific curiosity to get to that next question? Wow, that's so cool. How does that work? Tell me more. Or does it look more like this? Oh, I work at the lab. I use lasers sometimes. I write papers, answer emails. But what is the repercussion of not being that champion of science? What is that repercussion of not being the scientific linguist for your research? Well, we live in a day and age where the Discovery Channel can run an hour-long special on the discoveries going on at the Large Hadron Collider out at CERN, and the discovery of the Higgs boson, perhaps one of the most mon monumentous discoveries in our entire generation. And then five minutes later, it'll run an hour-long special on an alien abduction that happened in southern New Mexico with the same zeal and sense of legitimacy. Ugh, this is a huge problem. It causes so much misconceptions in science. When you have a program that has such fact and then something that's so blatantly fiction, it causes miscommunication and misunderstanding in the public. But what are we to do? Well. There's more than just that simple misconception. Just a few days before the Large Hadron Collider came online, you had news headlines like this. Will the doomsday machine 
create a black hole that will kill us all. That was Fox News. Or The Guardian, a Pulitzer Prize winning organization, mind you. Will we all die on Wednesday? Ah, what is this? Or perhaps simpler misconceptions, like we only use 10% of our brain. If I only use 10% of my brain, I would be lying on the floor right now instead of talking to you. Or perhaps more serious misconceptions, like vaccines cause autism. That misconception has caused one of the worst epidemics of whooping cough since the 1940s. Or nuclear energy fear, which is perhaps just misconceptions about radiation. In fact, it's, it's quite ironic because we use radiation for medical isotopes, uh, x-rays when we get a little too rambunctious in our sports, or, or cancer therapies. In fact, I'm giving off radiation right now. And it's not because I work for the lab. It's because it's a natural event. Or perhaps misconceptions with one of the most pressing issues of our time, that of climate change. One of the most common ones that I get is, uh, CO2 is such a small portion of our atmosphere. How is it that anything that we're contributing could cause any, any climate change at all? Ah, imagine if everyone knew this simple fact, that CO2 is a unique gas because it traps heat, like all other greenhouse gases. And while it is a small portion of the atmosphere, it has that unique property. And because we're adding more and more to the atmosphere, it's causing more and more heat being trapped. Uh, which is causing climate change. Just imagine for a moment if everyone knew that. Imagine how different our climate would look, how different our world would look if people just knew that simple fact. But what are we to do? There's this mass media misconception about science, but what are we to do about it? Well, with the help of some champions of science from all across the country, we're developing an organization called Ask a Scientist. It's full of graduate students and professors and staff members that are all scientific linguists for their fields. And we're actively going out into our communities to try and inspire that next Richard Feynman, or to at least to break down some of these misconceptions. And we're doing that by having these very big demos. Uh, like, take my university, for example. We're having this very big uh, pool of non-Newtonian fluid, which is this dense liquid that you can run on. And it's like running on water. It's super fun. Or Tennessee, for that example, they have this huge robotics culture, so they're going to have robots roaming around and flying all over above to try to engage the public. Or Harvard, they're taking it one step further. They're having science street art and science theater to try and engage the public and try to inspire the next great scientist. But there's a lot of science advocacy organizations, but we're a little different. We're holding a national Ask a Scientist Day, a full day event with all these fun activities, with disciplines from all over the place. It's really exciting to see how each university has their own flavor, their own methods for promoting science. But we all have a common goal. We all believe that everyone has a right to know how important science is to their lives. So I'll leave you with this. If you believe as we believe, that everyone has a right to know how important science is to their lives, then I challenge you to do this. Next time that you're met with that question, so what do you do? Be the champion for science. Be that scientific linguist for your research. Because we don't need to wait for the next Carl Sagan or the next Neil deGrasse Tyson. You're right here. You can be that champion of science. Because who knows, Richard Feynman was the son of a uniform maker. Who's to say the next great scientist isn't the son of a tow truck driver? Thank you.